Here we go. Might as well get this off my behind me because there's no point in having them on there. You can see that when you're about to go live. That's never a good starting point. <laughs> People seeing what you've been working on. Um, but hello, everybody. I hope you're having a fantastic Friday. Hope you're well. I am just about to start our little uh, live, going live, Ask Maka Anything. Today's suppose, topic, today's conversation will be around sports psychology and probably everything to do with mindset and elite performance in the, in the sporting world. So if you do have any questions or any comments, please do drop me a message on whether it's Twitter, just Paul McVay 77 or obviously I'm going live on Instagram. Uh, if you want to join on there, Paul McVay 77 and of course Facebook and LinkedIn. So feel free to, to jump on and give me uh, any questions you might have around the whole topics of sports psychology, mindset, mentality, how to get you know more from yourself, whether it's you as a player, whether you might be a parent and you have children who are who are playing, love sports and are trying to maybe aspire to become a professional and hopefully might be able to help you with that side of it. Maybe when it comes to the, the psychology of uh, a young player, how do they almost find the balance between enjoying what they do and, and just going out for the love of the game, whatever sport that may be, whether it's football, rugby, GAA, athletics, golf, tennis, whatever. Just let me know if there's a, a balance between enjoying your sport as a as whether it's your child or or a kid and trying to help them perform and be better and and get to the top of what probably could be considered, especially in football, one of the most competitive and most ruthless industries around. And I think that's something that I found over the years is that whenever I was growing up, I don't think my dad had a concept of pushing me and wanting me to be the best that I could be maybe he did and he just didn't tell me but I definitely think that it was something that I benefited from because I never felt any pressure I never felt any kind of almost vicarious desire to get to the top of professional sport my dad was just there he just support me he was there at all our games he was bringing me to training I and mean, we only did training once a week but brought me to training brought me to games on a Saturday and all I felt from a dad and my mum who when she was when she was interested in it, because she's not really a football fan, but it was really just that love and support. And I'm just wondering if there are any parents out there who either see other parents or other people who are maybe pushing their children or pushing their their kids, probably maybe not in the way that you agree with. So be interesting to see around that side whether it's a parent for their child trying to help them and support them or are they pushing them to you know strive to be the best they can be so i suppose it's an interesting balance on that side but yeah today's today's session ask mac anything so if you are on twitter facebook instagram youtube um wow getting the same message my my volume is really low so i will speak up as much as i can as as soon as I can, let me try and turn this volume up as well. It could be also to do with the the way that I'm holding this on Instagram. It's on little Osmo Mobile, so it's almost like a little uh, device to be able to hold my, my phone in, in in the right place. So maybe that's blocking the microphone potentially, but I will speak up a little bit louder just in case you can hear me. And yeah, today's session, Ask Mark, I'm really just trying to understand What's your thoughts on sports psychology? What do you think is the benefit of it? Have you ever used a sports psychologist? Um, do you think they're they're worth using? Or do you think it's just something that actually it's a waste of time? And really everything about getting to the top of elite sport is to do with the technical ability or the physical ability of the athlete. So if you think that is something that is of interest to you, then please drop me a message, drop me a question um, on on instagram as i say on linkedin facebook twitter youtube whatever way you want to get involved today and whatever we're doing if if you think this is something that may be of interest to you then it, i suppose it's something that i've always benefited from so i've always seen the the reason why i should be doing and applying it to my my life and my career and anyone who's joining who maybe doesn't know about my background then if you consider that I left 
Belfast in Ireland at 16, so in the mid-90s, to go and join Tottenham Hotspur. And to be able to go and play for a world-class team, even though they weren't the best team in the world, but considering the levels I was coming from of amateur youth football, to then be able to go and try and be involved in a professional football team, a Premier League team, a team that's been you know at the top level of professional sport for a long, long time. And so whenever I had that opportunity to go and join Tottenham Hotspur, it was with the likes of your Jurgen Klinsmans, your Teddy Sheridans, your... Darren Anderton, and Nicky Barnby, Saul Campbell, so some amazing people. Even the fact that players, sorry, even the fact that we had Ozzy Ardiles, World Cup winner, as the manager at the time, was just so interesting to me to be able to try and understand, learn from, and try and, I suppose, apply to my own game what these guys were doing and just being around them was, was yeah, such an amazing experience. But when I first joined in, in, as a 16 year old over in Tottenham Hotspur, I had no idea about this world of psychology or mental performance. And so whenever I actually read a book, so if we have any of our American friends or any American colleagues who are, who are joining us today, I know it's early in the morning for you, but if you are joining us, you might've heard of a guy called Tony Robbins, Anthony Robbins. And I remember reading a book by Tony Robbins when I was about 17. And it completely changed my life because it ended up, it started talking about the things that I had no idea about. I absolutely had no idea about the, the impact that psychology could have on your performance. And I'm just going to take a pause on that story for a second, just because we've got our first question in here for today. And it's really about COVID and affecting the players and talking about playing in front of crowds and about being worried about that and have I spoken to anybody and and yeah that's really really interesting because whenever you have seen the players playing in front of an empty stadium in the Premier League or whatever other sport around the world you can definitely tell a difference can't you between how they play and the kind of almost like getting caught up in the atmosphere of 50,000 people there and at a stadium and will and yawn or of course the opposite playing against a team who has 50,000 of their home fans and you're the away team and you're going to try and play and you're trying to quad in the crowd and you're trying to, you know, really go and do a job on the other team. And that's that's really fascinating. And it was something we actually studied whenever I did my master's in sports psychology. And that was one of the topics, ironically, in one of the modules. It was to do with how much of an impact does being the home team have on you? And... I suppose there was two sides we ultimately worked out. There was two sides to the to the argument. One is if you have 50,000 people cheering for you and wanting you to win and that's your team, you're the home team, then I suppose you could say that's brilliant because you've got support, you've got the, you know, the people behind you. But of course that comes with the pressure of then having to perform in front of 50,000 people and you going out there needing to be, you know, on top of your game, doing well, the team expect to win. But like the analogy of you know in the Coliseum with the gladiators going out <laughs> and essentially they have to decide whether there's kind of yes are you doing what we want you to do or very often there was a whole lot of thumbs down and let's say thumbs down was a, a polite way of doing it because the amount of times we would lose a game at home and we would see players physically and verbally getting abused coming off the pitch which you think these are your home fans this is your home team and yet they're verbally abusing our players walking off the pitch which was really interesting and really sad as well because you kind of think if you're a fan you're supporting your team but of course every fan has their opinion they have to decide whether that team is doing what they want them to do and if they're not happy with it then they generally let them know that they're not happy and that can be through booing it can be through you know shouting at players as they're coming off the pitch or whatever so there's actually two sides of the coin, I think, of being in the home team. You have that great support when you're winning, and if you score a goal and you're celebrating in front of you know 50,000 people, it's an amazing feeling. But actually, if you're not performing and you're expected to perform, you're expected to win, then the pressure can build up and struggle with that. But I suppose that goes into the question, which is what happens when there are no fans? Well, that entire dynamic of having fans in the stadium, home fans or away fans, completely dissipates and you're then just 11 players against 11 players and effectively there is no support it's just whether the team's playing or not so definitely saw a huge difference I don't think the players 
were worrying about the fact that they didn't have supporters there. I think the players were actually thinking that what would normally have given them that extra edge of that motivation or that it's almost interesting when you when you play at the professional level, we've all played in games and there's been low crowds there and it's like there's no motivation, there's no real I suppose that that extra little one or two percent to go the the above and beyond. But when you do have suddenly 10, 20, 50,000, whatever it is, the most I ever played in front of a couple of times was 75,000 people, 75,000 fans, and there were two amazing, amazing games to play in. One was when we got to the uh, playoff final in 2002, Norwich City against Birmingham, and it was at the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff because Wembley was getting developed at the time. And we ended up getting to a penalty shootout so after 90 minutes, extra time, and then a penalty shootout in front of 75,000 fans was, as you can imagine, absolutely nail-biting. And unfortunately for us, we ended up, we lost to Birmingham, and they get into the Premier League, and, and we didn't that year. We didn't for another couple of years. And then the other game was was playing a game for Norwich City when we managed to get into the Premier League, and that was then going to Old Trafford. I think it was whether it's 75 or 76,000. Just playing in a stadium that is so incredible it's it's you know it's, it's iconic it's you know it's world famous and to be able to play in front of that stadium and, and you know if anyone follows me on social media or you've come across any of my stuff that i've done you probably will have heard about a million times how i managed to, to score against uh, manchester united at old trafford in the premier league and that and that was really a, a kind of a a really interesting time because you ended up you scored against this team and you've probably dreamt about it. I think I've dreamt about it for years and years and years of scoring against Manchester United in the Premier League in front of all these fans. And yet we were 2-0 down. <laughs> but it only brought us back to 2-1. It was towards the end of the game. We kind of didn't really deserve anything out of the game. And we ended up, we lost the game, but I'm still celebrating because we scored in front of 75,000 fans. And it's it's against Cristiano Ronaldo and Paul Scholes and Roy Keane and all these absolutely amazing players. So yeah, it was it was interesting. But back to it, playing in front of the fans and not playing in front of the fans, there is definitely a difference in terms of what a player will and won't do because of that advantage of, of fans cheering you on or not. So anyway, the whole point why we're doing this and, and anyone who's joining us, appreciate you joining us. If you do have any questions, do let me know and I will try and keep on top because it's hard whenever you've got LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, all going. But if you do have any questions, give me a give me a shout and let me know. But since you were talking about sports psychology today, I have absolutely loved this world for a long, long time. I mentioned at the start that I started this suppose, journey, this understanding of what this world was all about when I was 17. And by reading a book completely changed my life and put me on a different path. Instead of going down the route I thought I was going to go down and suddenly going down the route of of this, I suppose, desire to learn, this willingness to be open-minded and wanting to improve what I do. And so as I started applying more and more of these things to my life, I think it really helped me in my career. And, you know, if anyone's seen me, I'm, I'm clearly not the biggest guy in the world. You know, I'm only five foot six, so... That is uh, not exactly uh, a colossus on the football pitch. And, you know, especially when we had the likes of Crouchy in our team, you know, Crouchy six feet seven and me four feet nothing short. So it was just, yeah, it was such a difference. But then because physically you can't really do a lot to, to change, you know, what you have to offer. So then being able to, you know, think about, okay, I can't really change much around the technical side, can't really change much around the physical side. But for me, the one big area that I could do something about was the psychology or the mental side of my performance. And I think that was such a really, really good decision for me at a young age to learn how to improve that side. And so this has taken us all the way through to now. I, you know, in the last 10 years since I stopped playing professionally, I was really fortunate to manage to go and work with two Premier League clubs. And the first one was Norwich City, who obviously just got promoted back into the Premier League. And I was fortunate to work with, with Norwich for two seasons when I stopped playing in 2010. And then in 2012, I joined Crystal Palace as a sports psychologist there. And, and to be able to work with Crystal Palace for five seasons was you know, such a learning curve, such a, such a new way of doing things because 
the players I was working with at Norwich were very different to the demographic I was working with at Crystal Palace. They were very much, you know, like uh, young players coming from Southeast London with a very, very different background and, and different attitudes and different education levels versus the ones I was used to at, at Norwich City. So, for example, Aaron Wambasaka, who was started at Crystal Palace on my first day and on his first day in the youth team, and then to be able to have five years with Aaron and seeing him develop and grow as a player and as a person. And then, of course, now he's gone off to Manchester United for £50 million. And, of course, you know, one of the best right backs in the league. I think some people would even say he's, he's the best one-on-one -on -one right back in the Premier League, which is just such a, an amazing uh, progression from Aaron. But just understanding how to work with the different players and learn from them so that I can take my knowledge and my experience and then share it in a way that's going to help them improve their performance. And so it's got to a point now where because I've been in that world of elite performance of, yeah, really just trying to understand what is it that makes a difference of why two talented players, one can almost get the the Premier League or professional sport or professional football and the other one absolutely achieves it, maximises their potential. And what the difference is, in my opinion and my experience, is always comes down to this. It's their mindset. It's their psychology. It's always their their ways of thinking or thinking habits that's going to determine how good they are in their career. So because that's been such a big part of my life, I've teamed up with another former sportsman so uh one of the guys that i've come across over the last 10 years working in the business world is leon lloyd so if there are any rugby fans who are joining us today then you might know of leon leon played for leicester tigers for i think about 10 years and in those 10 years he played with the likes of martin johnson and, and jordy murphy and lewis moody and all these you know top class world class uh, international rugby players and Leon was right up at that level and, and because Leon in that very successful Leicester Tigers team won six premiership titles he also won it's never good whenever your dad's calling you in the middle of a, in the middle of a line I go with that I'll call you back I'm a little bit busy <laughs> and, and, and for Leon to win those six premiership titles but he also won Don and won two European Cups, two Heineken Cups, and, and he didn't even just win the Heineken Cup. He scored the winning try in the last minute of the Heineken Cup. And you know, talk about a boy who dreamed, that is that is incredible. It's a bit like Ollie Gunnar Solskjaer scoring that goal against uh Bayern Munich in 1999 for United, you know, when they won the treble of just the old mate Teddy Sheringham scoring the first one in, in injury time, and then for Ollie to go and score in the last minute and win the European or win the Champions League and Leon did the exact same thing in rugby so Leon and I have been working together for the last couple of years and ironically we started in, in the speaking world so working on how to develop players or sorry develop people in terms of improving the public speaking and the keynote speaking and how to stand up in front of an audience because I'm sure you've heard the statistics of what is it that people are most afraid of in life or the top five fears in life and number one is speaking in public. And I find it so fascinating because I can completely understand and empathize with that because when I was playing professional football, the last thing I wanted to do was speak in public. In fact, I never spoke in public for the entire professional career, nearly 20 years, I never did it. And then I stopped playing in 2010 and for the last 10, 11 years, that's what I do for a living. That's what I do for a job. I go out and speak to organizations and speak in public all the time. And, and yet it's the number one reason that, or it's the number one fear that people across the world will have is speaking in public. Um, number three, by the way, is death. <laughs> so people are more afraid of speaking in public than what they are of dying, which you know, is a bit like people would rather be in the casket than given the eulogy by the person in the casket. Kind of blows my mind. Anyway, so Leon and I have been working in this world of developing keynote speakers. But because of our backgrounds, because of the fact we've both played in professional sport, obviously Leon had a much higher, uh, much more um, successful career than me because of his premiership titles, his European Cups. And we thought, well, our knowledge and expertise, putting that together to try and create a sports psychology program, we thought could be beneficial. So 
we have come up with a program called Get Psyched Up, which is our, our sports psychology program. And we have decided that we think the best way to give this program is in three stages. Because I was approached actually by a, by a club in America who said, listen, we're already got a sports psychology program. It's an online program. Ironically, it's with a, a Premier League sports psychologist. But essentially, it's online and that's it. There's no interaction. There's no suppose, ability to ask questions. There's no way to get any kind of uh, yeah knowledge from the person who's designed the course. So having thought about that, Leon and I thought, well, what can we do? What way can we try and use what's happened over the last 18 months in terms of COVID and everything going virtual and e-learning and not being in the same room with people? how can we share our knowledge in a way that still engages but has that hybrid learning hybrid approach or blended learning and so we decided that actually the first way that we need to engage with players or athletes is by doing a master class and delivering a master class because in my experience most people don't do anything near enough around their mental performance or their psychology so I think the first stage of that masterclass is actually just me saying, listen, guys, or girls, this is what I would recommend. And the reason why I'm recommending is because of X, Y, and Z, and you take the, through the different things of why it's so important. But once they understand why it's important, that's the first stage because it's about engagement. If people haven't engaged in the subject, if people don't even understand why they should be working on their psychology, then they're not going to do anything about it. And funny enough, if you were here at the start of the session, I had a little whiteboard on my fireplace over there just because I was doing a, a quick session with the team yesterday in Tennessee, actually give them a shout out. So our, our first ever inaugural masterclass for a Get Psyched Up program was with Tennessee Wesleyan over there. So Luke Winter, thanks very much for, for bringing us in. And we did our masterclass to be able to help those guys understand and effectively there's four areas of performance that comes from the English FA actually. But if you wanted to understand how to improve your players if you're a coach or as a player or an athlete or suppose even if you're working in the corporate world if you want to understand how to improve the different areas of your performance they fall into four core i didn't bless you there by the way that was not me blessing anyone that was uh that's not my gig that's um if anyone knows philip Moran, my old teammate from Norwich city northern ireland and i don't know why i've look like i'm praying now at this stage because he's also a priest so i'm gonna put my hands down here put him up here but essentially he is gone from playing for manchester united with the likes of david beckham paul schools ryan Giggs, roy Keane, all those guys so my friend philip moran from belfast actually used to play for my team here it's another plunket with us in belfast at 16 and then he went off and joined manchester united and he was there at the start of that treble winning season in 99 that i mentioned earlier and because he was part of that squad, in other words, the first game of the season they played, I think it was against Birmingham, and he scored a hat-trick. And then a week later, he was sold to Norwich City. And then, of course, that Manchester United team went on and won the treble that year. And Philip Mulrine went on to Norwich City. I'd gone to Spurs in 94 in 2000, whenever Phil joined Norwich City. I then joined Norwich City, so our lives have kind of just constantly overlapped with each other and what we're doing. And then Phil went on, had a few, eight, seven, eight years in Art City, similar to myself. And then he finished his career. I finished my career and went down the, the route of public speaking and, and sports psychology. And Philip Moran became a priest. <laughs> so when I said about those four corners, I wasn't blessing you. And I wasn't saying that's actually Phil's job. If anybody needs a blessing, you should definitely contact them. <laughs> But if it's more to do with the four corners of performance and those four corners of what you would divide the page into is top left is the technical aspect of being able to do either your role in a corporate job or plan on the field. So your technical ability to do what you need to do. Then it's your physical ability. And of course, from my background of sport, the physical attributes are so, so important. In the corporate world, they've probably been less important over the years. But I would say even now, there's more of a, an awareness that the physical ability and your physical health has a huge impact on your ability to do your job, even in the corporate world. And I think even the last 18 months have probably shown that, that it's become really heightened, really aware that you need to get out and walk, that you need to go for a run, you need to go and do your exercise so that when you come back to your desk or wherever your place of work is, 
you're more refreshed, you're more in the head in the game. So the physical side is still really important. Then of course the top right is the psychological. How important is the psychology of your performance? And then the bottom right is what we call the social. I suppose social would be considered the things that you do when you're not competing or playing from a playing side or from a sporting background. But of course the social side could be when you're not in your job, what's your social life like? How is that impacting? your your uh your ability to do your job are you at the two in the morning are you drinking loads are you not getting enough sleep are you eating the right foods all of that social side all impacts on performance but i think for me it was always down to the psychology that is the biggest impactor of performance and so that's why leon and i decided to create our get psyched up program so helping people understand that this engagement this master class in stage one is a way for us to be able to deliver that buy-in from the players and the athletes get them on board so that then you can take them to stage two which is our e-learning program our get psyched up program let's give them the ability to learn what we know and that's a huge challenge because if you're taking my experience which is 25 years in professional sport so nearly 20 years as a player and nearly 10 years as a sports psychologist taking leon's obviously exceptional knowledge of another sport rugby very different you know almost like diametrically opposed in terms of football and rugby in terms of their attitudes cultures the way they go about what they do in both sports but taking all leon's knowledge of you know winning heineken cups and european cups and then combining all of our knowledge together nearly 40 50 years of, of elite sport and elite performance and then giving a framework to be able to share that with our with our players that we're working with now we're really happy that we had the framework of of psyched which the reason why we went with psyched is more because it's to do with your performance the statistics and just understanding you know higher statistics actually apply to your game and what you do because most people are very subjective in their understanding of of how well they've done for instance even if you've you played in a game recently first few questions when you come back in through the door is you know did you win what was the score um did you score and how did you play generally the three questions so again you can hit them with oh yeah we won no it didn't score how'd you play and of course how did you play then becomes three general answers of played well i was okay or had a stinker and you're going probably not statistically very accurate or very helpful so the p for insight is for performance s for statistics why is all about you all the things that you can do and again there's a huge raft of things that we can give in terms of mental skills and and tools strategies to be able to help people um then it comes to c and that's confidence and it's so fascinating because for nearly 10 years working as a sports psychologist the number one thing that players premier league players or coaches would come in and see me about is their confidence so again even understanding where does confidence from where does confidence come from? Do you know what confidence is? Do you know how to create it? Do you know how to take it away? Do you know what impacts it? And all of these things are all what most players, in my experience, have no idea about because they've never studied it, they've never read about it, they've never worked with sports psychologists. So giving them some help, that would be a really, really good starting point. Then to do with um, H's around habits, and again, what habits are you doing on a daily basis so that you understand that they are going to build up and build up and increasingly going to impact your performance? Ease about your emotions. How is your emotional self-management, whether you're on a football pitch, soccer pitch, rugby field, in the office, going into a boardroom, going in for an interview, about to your driving test, how are you managing yourself emotionally? And then the last one, D, is about developing relationships. And of course, we know that we can't do this by ourselves. Um, that's a really, really good one to work on is how do we develop those relationships because we need those relationships to um, improve what we do. So just got another question coming in. It's going to be the last question because I'm just about to finish for this half hour for this week's Ask Maca. So have you dealt with difficult managers in your past, both sports but more in business? And I've got to say that that is a really good question because a lot of the times it comes down to ego and the ego is generally something that gets in the way of whenever you have i suppose someone who thinks they're at a certain level and because they're at a certain level they might have a little bit of power they might have a little bit of influence over 
whether you come in and work with them, what the team does, except the culture within the organization. And I think that is a really, really tough thing to talk about in terms of how do you manage those egos? But I think one of the first things to do is to try and help that person understand that we're all at whatever level we're performing at, but that we have room for improvement. And generally, those difficult managers are generally people who have less awareness that they need to improve and more of the ego of what can I do for me? So really good question. I actually do need to shoot because I've got another meeting to jump on to here and another call to go on. But I really appreciate everybody jumping on. I think maybe on possibly on Instagram, I might have had some people struggling to hear me. So I'll maybe work that out for next week. Hopefully, if you're on YouTube, uh, Facebook, Twitter or LinkedIn, hopefully you've heard everything well. Hope you enjoy that. Hope you're interested in potentially what we're about to do in terms of our sports psychology program. If you have got anyone who may be interested then please drop me a message get in touch obviously all my social medias uh, platforms and and connections are all at paul mcveigh 77 or if you want to drop me an email it's just paul mcveigh at me.com or probably the best thing to do might be just go on my website which is paul uk, and you can get in touch with me there you can also download download my book if you'd like to um it's called the super footballer is dead it's is on my website so please feel free to go and get a free copy of it there Okay, everyone, I hope you have a great week and I will catch you again soon.